You know, I do feel like that sabbatical on the big books is quickly coming to a close, but not yet. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike, back with another TBR video, this time for September of 2024. Can you believe it? Almost September. Seems like I was just giving out my plans for the beginning of the year not that long ago. Like I said, I feel like that sabbatical on the big books is coming to a close, as is this whole one per month plan. What I mean by that is I've been doing one sci-fi, one horror, one fantasy, and one miscellaneous book every month while I've been trying to get back into the swing of things because that can help you avoid burnout. I don't feel like that's going to last much longer. Not because I'm not appreciating that. I am. But I'm getting to that point where I'm like, I'm mostly a fantasy channel here. I don't think I can get by doing one fantasy book per month. So that might actually be changing here very soon. But I do want to be more open to making sure I read horror and sci-fi as well as just the fantasy on the channel. But I do have my plans for September. We're going to keep that same format here. Let's kick things off with the first book, which is going to be book number two in our Quilluminati plans. If you don't know Quilluminati, is when Brian over at Belltube and Dr. Philip Chase and John from Talking Story and I get together and we pick some book that's kind of out of our wheelhouse a little bit. Something that I think I would fall under my miscellaneous uh, umbrella here. And that's because it's going to be something that isn't just SFF. It isn't something that you know, we read all the time. It's not part of a series. It's, it's usually shorter than 500 pages. Just kind of make a step out of our comfort zone a little bit. And then we get together and talk about it. And our book for the third quarter of the year is going to be Ordinary Grace by William Kent Kruger. This is a book that's been highly recommended to me ever since I did my uh, my favorite coming-of-age stories years ago. And a lot of people would drop in the comments and say, if you read this one, I'm like, I've never even heard of it, but you guys have successfully put it on my radar. And that's why it was my pick. So uh, what we're doing is whoever is hosting the discussion gets to make the pick for the next book that we do read. And that's the one that I picked here was going to be Ordinary Grace. I'm very excited to do it just because of all the things I have heard about it. But what is Ordinary Grace about, you might be asking. Well, it's 1961 in New Bremen, Minnesota. It was a time of innocence and hope for a country with a new young president. But for 13-year-old Frank Drum, it was a grim summer in which death visited frequently and assumed many forms. Accident, nature, suicide, murder. Frank begins in a season preoccupied with the concerns of any teenage boy. But when tragedy unexpectedly strikes his family, which includes his minister father, his passionate artistic mother, Juilliard-bound older sister, and wise beyond his years kid brother, he finds himself thrust into an adult world full of secrets, lies, adultery, and betrayal, suddenly called upon to demonstrate a maturity and gumption beyond his years. This is the account of a boy standing at the door of his young manhood, trying to understand a world that seems to be falling apart around him, discovering the terrible price of wisdom and the enduring grace of God. This should be a lot of fun for me because I get a lot of, of kind of similarities between this and Boy's Life by Robert McCammon, which I love. But I do think it's interesting to take place in Minnesota, which is where Brian lives. And uh, I'm going to be curious to see uh, what Brian knows in these places. Like, for example, I don't know what Juilliard is. Is that like a famous school, a college up in Minnesota? I have no idea. I have no idea what that is. So it'll be fun to kind of peel his ear back and ask him, hey, is this what things were like back in 1961 in Minnesota? And that's where we get to make the jokes about uh, who's the oldest on this discussion. There we are, all graybeards here. That's why Brian is clean shaven. Next up, this one. It's going to be the fantasy offering, and I am really, really excited about this one because this is one of those authors. I've said this before. I said it about John Gwynn. I said it about Adam Neville, where you buy a bunch of their books, and you've never read them. Like You just get this idea you're going to like this author, and one of those for me has been Anthony Ryan, and it's, I put it off for a while reading Anthony Ryan, and it was just, I can remember what I was talking about recently, and someone asked me, hey, do you have this book on your list? I think it was Covenant of Steel, and I was like, I do. I have lots of Anthony Ryan books. I need to actually finally read one. You said, you know what? I think September's going to be the time. So I put out a nice poll on Twitter, which, you know, is just the perfect scientific poll, you know, to put it on Twitter. Because, I mean, that's going to reach all the masses, even though I don't think even a, as much as a third of my viewers are on Twitter. Uh, the ones I put up there was Covenant of Steel, which I think was, uh, is it starting with Pariah? Is that the first book of that? And whatever the first book in Covenant of Steel was, or Blood Song, or something else. And Blood Song, one guy's going away. It was Blood Song all the way. And I didn't expect it not to be because I've had recommendation, recommendations for Blood Song since all the way back in 2019, I think, when I reviewed uh, the first book in The Demon Cycle by Peter V. Brett. I got lots of recommendations for this. And what people have told me about this is 
Uh, yeah, the trilogy is kind of a letdown at the end, but you can treat the first book like coming of age, and it is one of the best first books ever in any fantasy series. And it's a coming of age fantasy, which you know is something I am crazy about, obviously. But uh, yeah, this has been very, very uh, appealing to me for a long time. And I don't know why I've waited so long to finally do this. I think it's just, you know, I kept on saying, I, I want to do it when I can do like the series as a whole. I was doing a couple things a couple years ago where I was, you know, doing like a trilogy in a month and stuff. And now when it go on there, and I'll be honest, it was Patrick's review of book three that really scared me off of the series for a long time. But even he was like, dude, you've got to read at least Blood Song. So here we are, guys. I'm going to be doing Blood Song. So I want to thank everybody who voted for that and gave feedback on it. As for Covenant of Steel, if I love this book, obviously Covenant of Steel is definitely still going to be on my list. But I do have about 15 books by this author. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be checking out more of his work regardless of how this goes. But Blood Song, if you're like me and you're one of those who have not picked this one up yet... What is Blood Song about? Well, Valen Al Sorna was only a child of 10 when his father left him at the Iron Gate of the Sixth Order. The brothers of the Sixth Order are devoted to battle, and Valen will be trained and hardened to the austere, celibate, and dangerous life of a warrior of the faith. He has no family now, save the Order. Valen's father was a battle lord to King Janus, ruler of the Unified Realm. And Valen's rage at being deprived of his birthright and dropped at the doorstep of the Sixth Order like a foundling knows no bounds. He cherishes the memory of his mother, and what he will come to learn of her at the Order will confound him. His father, too, has motives that Valen will come to understand, but one truth overpowers all the rest. Valen Al Sorna is destined for a future he has yet to comprehend, a future that will alter not only the realm, but the world. So this sounds very exciting. I, I, I get Conan vibes off of it. I don't know why, because it doesn't. it's not Conan at all. Uh, maybe a little bit of David Gimmel's legend in there. I don't know. I feel like uh, you you read enough of these fantasy books, you're going to kind of just read a synopsis and say, hey, that reminds me of this or that or whatever. But you know, someone who is basically sounds like they're being sent to the wall you know, when they because they're like a third or fourth in line and they don't get to have their birthright. You know, That's just kind of what happens when you're like that. But I don't know if it's like that or all of this is uh, his father made a deal or something. I guess we're going to find out. Finding out a lot about his parents, it sounds like, too, along the way. And I don't know how many years this goes through because I do think by the end of the series, he is of age. So I'll be interested if the first book is the coming of age story and then we kind of go on from there. But uh, yeah, very exciting times. That feels like one that's kind of getting off the bucket list because like I said, it has been on there in the plans for quite some time. And I'm glad now that I've made this video, uh, it is set in stone. It is actually happening and I'm excited to do it as for the next one. This has been on my list for quite a bit as well. And I talked about this one when I talked about uh, post-apocalyptic books that uh, I haven't actually gotten to yet. Now, one of the comments that came up a lot is why this one didn't come up when I made my best apocalyptic books, best best post-apocalyptic books. Yeah, that's a fun word to say for me. I, I, I struggle with it at times. But um, I'm glad to finally do it. And what really kind of encouraged me is Folio Society sent me a really, really nice collector's edition of A Canticle for Leibowitz. Now, this is one of the most stunning editions ever. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you get to see all these unboxings of these magnificent books before I show them off on my book hauls or whatever. But yeah, I had planned to do Forever War this month and Can Canticle for Leibowitz. Uh, before the end of the year, but I kind of flipped them once I got this really beautiful edition because uh, I, you get something that's gorgeous, you just want to read from it. And this is a story that I've been really, really pushed a lot by people that watch the, not only that video, but just anytime we talk about any kind of post-apocalyptic sci post sci-fi, every time, every single time, I'm going to say post-apocalyptic wrong. It has have a 100% failure rate on it. But uh, it's one that's uh, been highly recommended. Anytime I talk about like Swan Song or I, or I talk about Fallout, something like that, people are like, well, the best, you know, they drop the nuke and here's society afterwards kind of story is always kind of for Leibowitz. Apparently they have like some serious heavy lore in these books. It makes it a little different than all of the other ones that are out there. But that's a, that's a genre that I'm always going to be interested in. The What happened after the bombs drop? How do we keep society going? So a canticle for Leibowitz if you are like me and you've never picked up this classic, which I've heard about for years, and you want to know what it's about, I got you covered here. Because in a nightmarish, ruined world, slowly awakening to the light after sleeping in darkness, the infant rediscoveries of science are secretly nourished by cloistered monks dedicated to the study and preservation of the relics and writings of the blessed Saint Isaac Leibowitz. In the depths of the Utah desert, long after the flame deluge has scoured the earth clean, a monk of the order has made a miraculous discovery, holy relics from the life of the great saint himself, including the blessed blueprint, the sacred shopping list, and the hallowed shrine of the fallout shelter. 
In a terrifying age of darkness and decay, these artifacts could be the keys to mankind's salvation. But as the mystery at the core of this groundbreaking discovery unfolds, it is the search itself for meaning, for truth, for love that offers hope for humanity's rebirth from the ashes. Sounds very, very interesting. We got some kind of order, I do believe, where they uh, they have like the last surviving like actual texts of humanity, and it's just like a sacred library that they're kind of protecting to try to you know reinstitute society as a whole after the you know after the scorched wasteland becomes livable again. So that's kind of what I've heard in bits and pieces. But, uh, you know, sacred shopping list, you know, is that like, you know, when you go to the store and you got to get like the perfect eggs and make sure you get the milk that's like the best expiration day? I don't know. That's what I hear when I when I hear the sacred shopping list. That's what I think about. But, uh, yeah, interested. Interested for sure. And I'm glad I'm finally getting this one off my bucket list because it's been there for quite some time. And to get to read from such a beautiful, beautiful edition, it's very exciting. Very exciting. So I got to thank Folio Society for sending that to me because, uh, wow, wow, as I can say, they do amazing Amazing work over there. And lastly, my horror book for the month. I'm loving getting a new horror book on here every single month because what I said uh, about a year ago is I want to read more horror that's not just Stephen King. I want to expand my horizons on modern horror because I feel like there's so much out there that I haven't actually discovered yet. And I'm getting so many great recommendations from you guys. And a great recommendation I got last year was for my best friend's exorcism by Grady Hendrix. So I figured, hey, I had such a great experience with that. I want to go back, and we're going to be doing this Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. I think that's what it's called. Did I say it right? Yes, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. Uh, I mean, I was interested off of the name alone. That's, that's 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 something. I don't know. I get like Buffy vibes off that, but when I read the synopsis, that is not very much the case. But I hear vampires, and I automatically go to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. just because how it's going to work because, you know, favorite TV show of all time. I love it. But uh, this sounds very, very fun because, you know, with Kaluminati, I've got a book club that I'm in, obviously. And I look at this channel as one big book club, really, and all those read-alongs that we do in the Discord. So the fact that this is putting a book club into a vampire story, that sounds like a ton of fun. I thought My Best Friend's Exorcism was super underrated and how well it did coming of age and friendship and class warfare and serious issues. You know, serious issues that took place in the 80s with that 80s nostalgia horror, which has become a subgenre in its own right. But this... Sounds a little more modern, and uh, we're going to tell you now how that is because Patricia Campbell has always planned for a big life. But after giving up her career as a nurse to marry an ambitious doctor and become a mother, Patricia's life has never felt smaller. The days are long, her kids are ungrateful, and her husband is distant. Her to-do list is never really done. The one thing she has to look forward to is her book club a group of Charleston mothers united only by their love for true crime and suspenseful fiction. In these meetings, they're more likely to discuss the FBI's recent siege of Waco as much as the ups and downs of marriage and motherhood. But when an artistic and sensitive stranger moves into the neighborhood, the book club's meetings turn more into speculation about the newcomer. Patricia is initially attracted to him, but when some local children go missing, she starts to suspect that the newcomer is involved, and she begins her own investigation, assuming that he's a Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy. But what she uncovers is far more terrifying. And soon she and her book club are the only people standing between the monster they've invited into their homes and the unsuspecting community. This sounds a lot like uh, that movie Summer of 84. I like that a lot where this new guy moves into town right when all these kids go missing and he's a police officer and these kids swear up and down, very much influenced by Stranger Things, these kids swear up and down that he is the one that's responsible for murdering these kids. And it talks about the recent siege of Waco, so I'm guessing this takes place in the 90s because, guys, uh, Waco is about six hours that way. And I know all about Waco as a very, I have hot takes about Waco, as do a lot of people, but I'd like this channel not to get demonetized, so I won't get into that. But, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, very interesting. Uh, like I said, my, my best friend's exorcism took place in the 80s. If this takes place in the 90s, I think all horror should do that because I think when you put in the advent of social media and uh, smartphones, it really takes all the fun out of horror. It takes all the technology. Everything is explained away. You can record everything so people don't think you're crazy. You know, I feel like it just takes the fun out of it. So I think everything should take place in the 90s or earlier when you're dealing with horror. So if that's the decision that, uh, that Hendrix made here, that's, uh, that, that should be fun, if not just for the nostalgia bait alone, because I'm a Gen Xer, guys. We love nostalgia, and uh, if he put some of that in there, it's a nice bonus, but if he proved like he did in My Best Friend's Exorcism that he can make it about more than just the member berries, then that's exciting, and I can't wait to do it. And next month is spooky season, guys, and I've been narrowing 
that down. I will be keeping my same format. What I'll tell you about that, what I'm going to do is I'm keeping the one miscellaneous, one horror, one sci-fi, one fantasy, but what I'm going to be doing is making sure that they are all horror-based. So maybe like a historical fiction horror, maybe like a fantasy horror, a sci-fi horror, and a a horror horror, for for lack of a better phrase. But that's what I'll be doing next month. So I'll be nailing that down here for the for the next uh, few weeks before I make some final decisions. I got some really neat ideas for that, and I've been picking a lot of people's brains about what's some really good science fiction horror and things like that that I could kind of dip into next month. But that, we'll get there when we get there. But I'm excited for September because uh, I've got a couple new authors on here that I'm going to be trying, as well as returning to some that I didn't join the past. So it should be it should be fun. It should be a lot of fun. I can't wait to do it. So if you guys want to join me for any of these, I would love that. If you guys want to join us on Ordinary Grace to talk with Illuminati, uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. We would love to have you there for that discussion that we will have on Philip's channel sometime early in September. So uh, September 1st, that's the plan. Or actually, when I finish, the darkness comes before, which should be any day now. I'll be starting on Ordinary Grace, and I cannot wait to do it. So that's what I have planned for September, guys. What do you have on the list. Any of these? Are you going to join for any of these? If not, no big deal. I'd love you to drop some more ideas down below because I'm always looking for new ideas. So hit me in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there.